Oh, I'm sure you can do a better job than that. Are you okay out there today? You're very quiet. That's all right. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, and um, we've been camping there, and we're going to continue that today. And uh, we, you know, how many of you understand that we don't always know why things happen, but we know that God is in control. And uh, when the world looks like it's out of control, at the end, we know that God will weave all of it together and bring about His purpose. That's why we believe what we believe. Amen? And uh, so today I've got a little bit of a, uh, I, almost, <laughs> I almost said it was going to be an encouraging message, but uh, um, uh, hopefully it is an encouraging message. How many of you know that the Word is always encouraging if you apply it? Let's try that again. How many of you know that the Word is always encouraging if you apply it? Yes. How many of you know that the Word is always a two-edged sword if you don't? Yes. Why do we struggle? Because our struggle is not so much with the Word. Our struggle is with obeying the Word. And so today, uh, you know, we've been in this incredible series and uh, we're kind of weaving our way through it. So there's some, there's some uh, muddy, muddy waters that we have to navigate through over the next several weeks. And I'm going to muddy through them. And you say, uh, Pastor Henry, what are these muddy waters that you're talking about? Well, it's called a very short sentence, a very short word. It's called my and your sin, S-I-N. Look at your neighbor and say sin. Uh, say it with a little bit more authority. Say sin. sin. How many of you know we even struggle to say the word? It's, uh, 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 we kind of work through the process. But I want you to notice our key verse. Look at this. And um, the, my, my, my subject today is the facts of spiritual life. And the subtitle is beneath the surface. Uh, another title could be what lies beneath. Uh, uh, look at Hebrews 12 verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip every weight. Somebody say strip. Say every weight. Watch, that slows us how? Down. So these weights slow us down. Especially, somebody say especially. The what? The what? The sin that so what? Easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. It is, it is the age old question. Uh, um, are, are humans born intrinsically good with pure and righteous hearts, or are they born with a sin nature that, if left unchecked, will destroy their lives? B.F. Skinner, that famous psychologist, and his boys believe in the former, that people are born basically good, and, and that our southbound society eschews them and, and stain, stains them. It's because blaming the environment that we place people in. And this is a popular ideology being taught uh, even in our classrooms in the land today, that people are good. They just happen, you know, uh, to be in the wrong environment. And therefore, sometimes bad things happen uh, when these people do it. Uh, however, uh, whether that's a popular ideology or not, the Bible says something completely opposite. How many of you know that? Uh, it says from cover to cover, and when you read it, you'll understand it, uh, that we have potential for greatness but somehow, deep within us, we've got this rebellious nature. We have a fatal flaw, if you will, and of a sin nature, a, a natural tendency for us to uh, transgress, to go in the wrong direction. Look what Romans 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, now, when the word, I looked at the word all, it means exactly that. It means what? It means all. That means everyone. That means you are sitting next to somebody who has sinned. Now, let, let me just say this because I know this is going to go down like a lead balloon. But uh, if you have any doubts about sin nature, try this experiment. Have a baby. Well, you don't really have to have a baby. All you got to do is take a quick tour of our nursery and you can see the sin nature manifest real quick when there's toys involved. I know, I know babies are cute and cuddly and, and you know, all that, but they're little sinners. And they can't wait to advertise their depravity of being selfish. Come on, somebody. Self-centered and demanding. Uh, I sometimes wonder if our social scientists and psychologists have ever had children. 
because if they had, they would not be popularizing this whole idea. You know, daddy's little angel has a little demon on the inside of her. Can I get an amen for some of your parents at least? Uh, you know, maybe these social scientists or psychologists are grandparents who have forgotten about what kids are like. So, and I know as a grandparent, you have a little bit different take on that. But, you know, that's probably not a, 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 a one of the reasons not too popular to call uh, sin what it is, to call it sin. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's too harsh. It's politically incorrect. Nobody wants to talk about it, especially in church. Nobody wants to bring up the topic. Uh, we, we, you know, I mean, just try it. And we see that our faces contort when we say the word <laughs> sin. We, we struggle to say it. And, and you know what? We don't say we've sinned. We don't say that. We say, I've made a mistake. Uh, I made a boo-boo. Uh, uh, it, oh, it was a misunderstanding. I was just dumb. You know, I was just dumb. Everybody gets dumb once in a while. I was stupid. It was ill-advised. It was an oversight. It was a mishap. My bad. You know, uh, uh, Am I right? Amazingly, we, and then not only that, we take it a, a level further because not only do we, are we refusing to say that we've sinned, then we kind of, you know, back away, but we begin to explain. How many of you know we do a lot of explaining? Well, you don't understand my background. Uh, you don't understand the circumstances. Well, if you were in my situation, you would have cussed and yelled as well. You know, if you were married to my husband... Thank God we're not. But anyway, the reality is, is that we, we even go even deeper. We, 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 we begin to blame it on our genetics. You know, well, you know, it's just my Irish nature. You know, or, you know, you know us Italians, we're hot-blooded. Or, you know, uh, and, and we just kind of go through the, the motion. And sin is that innate, contagious, southward propensity uh, that we have for evil that is within all of us. Now, for those that are doing the overhead, I want you to go to Colossians 3, but I want you only to go to verse 5, uh, just so that you know, because I'll pick up the rest a little bit later on. Look what Colossians 3 verse 5 says. I'm going to build this because I know that today I have to go real slow, otherwise you're going to be real mad, uh, but it's okay with me. Look, look, at verse, look at verse 5 of Colossians 3 verse 5. Is that on the overhead? Okay, watch this. So put to what? Death, the sinful knowledge. I want you to listen to the language. Earthly things doing what? Lurking where? Where does sin lurk? Within us. It's not an outside thing. It's an inside job. It's beneath the surface. We don't always recognize it, but it is there. And then he goes on and gives us more specifics. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Rough language, isn't it? If sin is not dealt with, the problem with that is it leads to consequences. Sin, no matter what the breed, always carries a consequence with it. You could be saying to yourself right now, well, I mean, why even talk about sin? Because, I mean, maybe before the day's over, somebody's going to do mess up anyway. You know, you got a point. But if you would stay with me, I, I, I want, to, I, I want to, to change your perspective on this, not only to understand what sin does in your life, but also the alternative, the way of living that God has created for us. Uh, and maybe you'll change your position. What, what is sin? sin? Sin is an archery term. Uh, it, it, it just simply means missing the mark, falling short. Now, the problem with that definition is that it fails to take into account that when you miss something, you hit something else. A spouse is hit, a child is hit, a co-worker is hit, a career is hit, a character value is hit. It is missing the mark, but it's also hurting the heart of God. The Bible says that God hates sin. Do you know why? Because God loves people. And sin eventually hurts you, and sin eventually hurts others. Sin will always bring a pain that you cannot handle. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. That's what sin does. And God loves people. Why do you think God hates divorce? 
Why does God hate divorce? Because it rips people apart. It rips children apart. It brings confusion. And that is in the heart of, of human beings. Now, I know that, that you know, we cover up a lot, but I, I want you to understand that God's nature is restorative. And a lot of times we talk about the restoring nature of God, which is good, which is healthy, because we all need to be restored in some way, in some fashion, because sin has marked and hurt all of us. But I want you also to know there's another part of God, and that's called the preventive nature of God. And the preventive nature of God is that God does what? He gives us His Word. It's the same way like a parent would warn his or her children and would say to your child, now listen, son, listen, daughter, I, I, wa I want you to know that I've been around the block. I've got some mileage on me. Uh, I, I know I'm showing it as well. I've got some mileage on me. I've got some wear and tear. And some of the wear and tear that I have on my life is because some of the dumb decisions that I have made. I've made some dumb decisions, and I want you to know, son, I want you to know, daughter, if you would just listen to my words, you won't have to go through that same process. And what, what happens then is that you give them a word of warning. Why? Because you want to prevent them from having to do what you have had to do, where you've had to work through the restoring process. Now, thank God for His restoration. Thank God for His wholeness. Thank God for His healing. But we have to understand that if, if you're in this building and you haven't messed up yet, then don't, you don't have to. Come on now, somebody. Because here's what we know about sin. It comes naturally to all of us. And that can be traced back all the way to our, uh, uh, our brother Adam and his wife Eve. Adam made a conscious choice to do what? To rebel against God's what? Word. Uh, because the enemy lied and twisted and said, well, you know, does it really matter? You know, God's holding out on you. I mean, you know, really, just do your own thing. And, and we've had that since then. We sin. Here's why, why we sin. We sin because we think we can do our own thing better than God's thing. Nobody, but nobody taught me how to sin. Has anybody in this room, anybody online, anybody outside, could you tell me something? Have you ever taken a class on how to sin effectively? <laughs> Is there books that they write on how to be selfish? Come on now, somebody. No, they don't do that. Why? Because you don't have to teach us anything that we really know how to do by ourselves. No one taught me. I, I just know how to do it. Can I have a week, amen, for some of you sinners? Come on now. Uh, we just know how to manipulate. We just know how to cut corners. We just know how to subtly protect our egos. Uh, we just know how to do it. I, nobody tutored me. Nobody sat down with me. Nobody taught me. No, uh, we, I didn't have to go through a process of, of now you are in class one of sin 101. Then you're going to sin 201. Then sin 301. And uh, hopefully sin 501. No. Look at what the Bible says about sin so we can understand this very clearly. James 1 verse 15 says this. The temptation to give in to evil comes from where? From us and what? Only us. Where does it come from? And only what? Us. I want you online. I want you to type out us. Uh, we have no one to blame. Look at this. But the leering, listen to these words, seducing flare-up of our own lust. And I love the way the message paraphrase puts it. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby called sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. We've got to understand that about sin. The Bible warns us. So no matter what the breed, uh, uh, sin always has a consequence. And, and there's a result of sin. And the end result of sin is always the death of something. Uh, the entrance of it into the equation of life uh, brought death. Sin is always followed by a curse. Our sinfulness is proven in the fact that we all die. Sin and death are joined at the hip. They are, they are, they are brother and sister. They are together. They are inseparably linked. Uh, and during the Middle Ages, a group of theologians compiled a, a list of seven deadly sins. And they said that there were seven areas that caused the majority of the problems in our lives. And I truly believe that most of our hurts, hang-ups, and, uh, and habits, about 90% of them come from these seven deadly sins. And, and maybe some of you know them. Pride, anger, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, slothfulness. And we dealt with sloth. Now, have you noticed that we even changed slothfulness to make it sound a little bit more positive? Procrastination. So it sounded a little bit better than sloth, full of sloth. Hello, somebody. Come on now. Uh, we read in James concerning sin and temptation. Who sin? Watch this. James 1 uh, from verse 12. Blessed are those who endure when they are what? Tested. When they pass the... Work with me, church. When they pass the... 
they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. Now, do you understand that God has promised this? Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it how? More abundantly. God wants to lead you into the life that He has. When God created Adam and Eve, He placed them in something that was beautiful. He placed them in a garden. He placed them in a beautiful environment. He placed them in an environment where they could thrive. And then God says, I want you to tend it. I want you to keep it. I want you to look after it. I'm, I'm making you the stewards of this beautiful earth that I have created. And all of the earth is your playground, Adam. All of the earth, Eve. Now, I'm creating this so that you can, you can, you can work it. You can see it. You can pick the fruit. You can enjoy it. And, and, and I'm covering you with my presence. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm fellowshipping with you. And, and Adam and Eve listened to a lying serpent who was lying and saying that God was holding out, yet God wasn't holding out. God just knew that there is a propensity that if we step out in disobedience, that something is going to die because he even warned him. He says, if you eat of this fruit of the knowledge, listen to that, the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And, uh, another translation says, in dying you will die. Because what happened? Spiritually you're going to be cut off. And the moment you are spiritually cut off from the Father, then guess what? That's going to affect every arena of your life. And we see the result of that. And he goes on. And listen to what James says. He's promised us the crown of life for those who love him. When someone is tempted. Somebody say when someone is tempted. Look at this. He shouldn't say that who is tempting him. God is tempting him. God can't be tempted. Say, God can't be tempted by evil. And God doesn't do what? Tempt anyone. Everyone is tempted by his what? Own desires. And I, I want you to listen to the language. As they lure him away and trap him. These, these terms in the Greek, lure and trap, are what we call hunter and fisherman's terms. It, it means baiting a trap or a hook. And uh, if there's any hunters or fishermen, you know, uh, we, what do we use to attract fish? We use bait, right? And, uh, but there's something else. There's bait, but there's something underneath the bait. It's called a what? A hook. Uh, and how many of you know that's painful? If you, if you get that hook, and some of us are hooked. We're hooked on stuff. Why? Because we took the bait. Uh, uh, John puts it like this. He says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So bait appeals to our natural desire. Man, this looks good. But it also hides the fact that along with this comes what? Pain. Think about the guy uh, in the Old Testament by the name of Lot. Anybody know who Lot is? Uh, he would never have moved to the city of Sodom had he not seen what? The well-watered plains of the Jordan. David, when he, le when, when he messed up with Bathsheba, never would have messed up if, if, if he didn't see a UFO. How many of you know what a UFO is? Unclad female object. And, uh, you know, wh because what did he not see? He was short-sighted. He didn't see what was following that act. What followed that act was murder. What followed that act was the death of his own child. What followed the act was all of the, all of the challenges that he has brought on his own family where his own children rebelled against him time after time and set settling for second best. Uh, behind, you know, behind that covetous, beautiful woman. Uh, and he, uh, when he messed up, there was something else lying. Uh, the bait looked good. The problem is behind the bait, there was destruction. And sometimes we, we have to remind ourselves. Listen again, again in verse 15. Then desire becomes pregnant and gives birth to sin. When sin grows up, it gives birth to, de to death. Now, temptation is not sin. The sin is when temptation and evil desire get together. What happens? Evil desire becomes pregnant, and it has a birth announcement, sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings about what? Death. Why compare? Why, why do we do that? Why would the Bible compare sin with this kind of cycles of life? Sin is like a, 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 it's like a baby lion, like a, like a lion cub. How do you know lion cubs are cute? And you can play with them and I mean, they, they, kind of, they don't even have a growl. And they so, I mean, they, in some place in Africa, you can, you can play with some lion cubs. And, you know, it's nice. You can pay and you play with some lion cubs and they're all cute and cuddly. But how many of you know what happens to that lion cub? It's going to grow up. And you might play with that lion cub when it's small, and that might be a lot of fun, but give about four or five years, and it will eat you. <laughs> Fatality can occur. You know, it, it could tear you apart. 
Now, that's the same truth of sin. Uh, you know, some of you say, well, you know, I haven't experienced death yet. Well, guess what? If you, have, if you are messing up and you haven't experienced death yet, then guess what? Death, uh, what's happening? Sin is not yet fully grown, but it's going to grow up. And it's going to bring that baby tiger or that baby lion into full fruition. Sometimes it takes two years. Sometimes it takes four years, five years. Sometimes it takes decades to become fully grown. But when it becomes fully grown, there will be destruction in your life. You see, sin is enjoyable for a season. I'm just waiting for you guys to get it. You say, Henny, why do you say that? Because, listen, if sin was not enjoyable, none of us would be doing it. Hello, somebody. We have to, we have to understand that, and it's enjoyable. So temptation and desire get together, and desire makes the birth announcement called sin. When sin matures, it takes out an obituary, death, spiritual death. The book of Romans said that the wage of sin is there. Look at Romans 6, 23. For the wages, that means the earnings which you get. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But, thank God for the but. But the what? Free gift of God is eternal life through whom? Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about concerning sin and death and being, on, you know, uh, uh, being underneath, let me describe a story to you. I was uh, fishing several years ago with my older son, Parker, and uh, I, I've taken all my sons when they were at a certain age to what I, we call a man trip. Uh, uh, we call it a mancation. So it's just me and them, and they, they can pick anywhere, and whatever they want to do. And uh, we just go for a week or 10 days, and we just hang out together. And so I asked him, and he's a real, you know, outdoors guy, although he never leaves the house. But anyway, uh, um, I said, son, what do you want to do? He says, Dad, I just want to I just want to fish. And uh, I said, okay, great. Uh, so we'll just go. Uh, he said, I just want to drive up the coast, and we can just stop wherever and, you know, and fish wherever. We can fish in the ocean. We can fish in the rivers and lakes. What else? I said, hey, hey, that's going to be cheap. I like that. <laughs> and uh, um, it was the cheapest mancation that I took any of the sons on. But anyway, thank God for an older, wiser son. And uh, so we're fishing. And so we, we got to this one place down up in, in uh, Northern California, and um, they were renting boats. And so we, we, we decided, hey, you know, we're going to rent a boat. It was at an inlet. And uh, this inlet where they, comes from, you know, from uh, uh, um, uh, the mountains and all that and the trees and stuff like that that goes into the ocean. So they said, hey, there's a lot of fish here uh, in, in the inlet. And so we said, okay, we're going to fish in the inlet. So we hide the boat. We got our gear up. We got in a little boat. And we were, we were cruising down the inlet. And, you know, we were fishing a little bit. And then suddenly I, I thought I hooked a big one. And I mean, I was, I told Parker, I said, oh, this is awesome. I think I got a big one. And, uh, but the boat was drifting and drifting and drifting and uh, uh, we were not paying attention. And suddenly we were, we were beneath us, from beneath us, this massive tree came up. And, uh, and I mean, we, we panicked. Oh, uh, well, let me say I panicked. And I, I said, son, we, we got to do something. He says, he says, dad, well, let's just, uh, you know, let's just try to get out of the way. So I, I put my gear down. I tried to get out of the way. But the more I tried to get away, the tree came closer and closer and closer. And before we knew it, this tree was right underneath the boat. And I, I revved the engine. I tried, to, I tried to get away from it. And, I mean, we were, we were paddling like Olympic champions, weren't we, Parker? I mean, we were, we were paddling. We were trying to get out there. But no matter what I could do, I couldn't move. And then I started to, you know, rev the engine, rev the engine. But the more I revved the engine, uh, we were almost, I almost stuck the propeller on the tree. I mean, we had a wonderful time. And uh, uh, but it was nerve-wracking. So literally what we had to do is we had to go beneath the surface, push the tree away so that we can move on. And, and, and sin is sometimes like that. And, and I mean, we did, at first we did what, what, what all wise people would do. We rocked the boat. How I many of you know? Uh, we, we tried everything in our own power to, to get away. But the only way we could get away is to push that thing that was beneath holding us up away, to move away from it and not in our own strength. And, and sometimes sin is like that. We've got stuff that we are, that we are, we are trapped on. We, we, we kind of drove our boat and we had a fun time and it was wonderful and we didn't pay attention and now we are stuck on something. And the only way to get away from it is to get and engage and push the thing away. Sometimes you got to go beneath the surface. 
And there's a lot of subsurface sins that are uh, hanging us up. Look again at Hebrews 12 verse 1 and listen to what it says. So a large crowd of witnesses all around us. So we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially the sin. And listen to how the contemporary English version puts it. Just won't what? Let go. There are some stuff in our lives that, that just won't let go. That's why Lamentations 3 uh, verse 40 says, Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 1.30. God has united you with Christ Jesus. Who are you united with? Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God... Now listen to these languages. This language is important. For our benefit, God made him to be what? Wisdom itself. Wisdom itself. Christ made us, and I, I, I love this, Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and He freed us from sin. What a mouthful. We made right, we are made pure, we are made holy, and we are made free. Boy, I love it. We are made right, pure, holy, free. I'm right, I'm pure, I'm holy, and I'm free. I'm right, I'm pure, I'm holy, and I'm free. It almost sounds like a rap song. I'm right, I'm pure, and I'm holy, and I'm free. Why? Because of anything I done? Because of my because of my ability to get free? No, because that's what Jesus did for me. Therefore, as the scripture says in verse 31, it says this: if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. We need to go beneath the surface. But going beneath the surface is not just simply to identify sin and hear me now, but to focus on the solution. The problem is that some of us, we rely only on our human reason and not on the wisdom that's available to us through Christ Jesus. Human reason or common sense, as it were, is a useful servant, but should never be the final verdict of truth in our lives. When we exalt our own reasoning above God's word and will, we become what we call wise in our own eyes. To reason is healthy. Somebody say it's healthy. Why? Because it helps us to sort and evaluate. But we should never just simply lean on our own reasoning. The final verdict should always be left for the Holy Spirit. That is who we lean on in the decision-making process. The final wisdom is not on my ability to evaluate. It's not on my ability to decide, is this right or wrong? Thank God, I don't have to decide what's right or wrong. I can lean on the wisdom of Jesus. I can lean on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I can lean on the Word of God above all, and then I can evaluate my own self, but then I'm leaning not on my own understanding. I'm listening to what the Holy Spirit says, and that's how I make the decision. You see, progress happens, and hear this, this is going to be good. Progress happens when we engage the mind of the Spirit because the mind of the Spirit reveals the will of God. Let me say it again. Progress happens when we engage the mind of the Spirit. Let me just stop there for a moment and just say this to you. A lot of our problems is because we have the wrong kind of thinking about things. A lot of our issues is because we don't think right about sin. A lot of our issues because we don't think right about stuff. A lot of our issues even in the church today is because we don't think biblically. We are biblically illiterate. We don't think the Word of God. We think our own thoughts. And because we think, well, well, you know, my own thoughts are okay. I'm a smart person. I know how to live life. I don't need anybody else's input. And that leads us astray. Why? Because we are leaning on our own thinking instead of allowing our mind to be renewed by what God says and then drawing from the wisdom that is Christ Jesus for us and leaning on the mind of the Spirit. Why can I lean on the mind of the Spirit? Because God gave me the mind of the Spirit. Now, now listen to this. When we, the Spirit, because the mind of the Spirit reveals the will of God, why do I need the will of God? To fulfill the purpose of God for the pleasure of God. Boy, that's good stuff. I, I need the mind of the Spirit. Why? Because I, know, I need to know the purpose of God, and that brings the pleasure of God. That is, that, that's what we call is living by faith. Why have we received the mind of Christ? Why did God give us the mind of Christ? So that we may speak the word of the Spirit. Why do we have to speak the word of the Spirit? I'm going with this some way, so just hang with me. Why, why have we received the mind of Christ? So we speak the word of the Spirit to establish the will of God in our lives. We speak the word when we have the mind of the Spirit, and that establishes the will of God in our lives. This only happens when we walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. 
Henny, you say, why is it so important for me to get away from this carnality? Why is it so important to move away from this, from, from this stuff in my life? Why is it so important to go beneath the surface? Because right now, there are things in your life that has brought destruction, but you refuse to listen. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. You have been warned, but we refuse to listen. So why not? And you say, well, then, then it's, uh, it's over for me. No, it's not over. You are here. God brought you here for a reason. He ain't done with you yet. And he can turn it around. But how many times have God not turned things around for you just to go around, around? Oh, I, I know I'm not getting amens, but I'm okay with this. Why is it so important to move away from carnality? Because the carnal man lacks the capacity to receive the spiritual truth. Why does God want us to get out of sin? Because he wants to spoil our fun? No, because he knows the consequence. He knows where it ends up. He knows the destruction in our lives. And he knows eventually we we end up in a self-made prison. We are not free the way he wants us to be free. So we have the self-made prison that now we want to blame everybody else. We want to blame our hard life. We want to blame our environment. We want to blame what other people have done, what other people have said, how other people have manipulated. And that might might be all true. You might have had a hard life. You might have had work through the process. You might have people have done some bad things to you. But the reality is in the inside of you, if you had the mind of the Spirit, you can choose to go God's way and not your own. Because you have the capacity to discern, and that brings growth. Now, if, those are my words, but let's go to God's word. Let's hear what God says about this. Are you ready? This is going to be a little bit long, not sermon, but this. Because there's a lot of verse I've got to cover so you can see it in the context of it. Look, go with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, and we'll pick up from verse 9. Are you still with me, church? How about you online? Are you still with me? Don't go make coffee right now. Sit there. And shut up and listen, all right? Take some notes. Consequences are about to knock on your door, so you need this. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Watch this. That is what the Scripture means when they say, listen to the the beauty of this. No eye has seen. Somebody say, no eye has seen. seen. Say this. Say, no ear has heard. And, And I want you to listen to these next phrase. And no mind. Somebody say, no mind can even imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. What a verse. There's no eye that has seen this. There's no ear that has heard this. And there's no mind. You cannot even conjure up in your mind how good life could be if you trust Him. But he's going to give us a but, and this is a good but, because we, we take that verse out of context, and then we say, wow, well, you see that, yeah, you know, you'll never know what God has for you. You know, no, no mind, you know, no eye seen, no ear has heard, no mind is conceived. But, l- read the but, look at the next verse. Watch this. But it was to whom? Come on, help me. But it was to whom? Us that God did what? Reveal these things. These what? These things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived or imagined. That God has revealed to us. So how did God reveal these things to us? Look at the next two words. How? Come on, help me, church. By His Spirit. By His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. So that's why He says, do not walk in the flesh, but be filled with the Spirit. Because the people who are filled with the Spirit lives on a higher plane. The reason they live on a higher plane, they have discovered what true life is all about. And no matter how much you want to explain to a carnal Christian or a carnal individual about how good it is, they just don't get it. Why? Because they're leaning on their own understanding. And because they lean on their own understanding, they don't have the mind of God. And because they don't have the mind of God, they lack the revelation of the Spirit of God. And they cannot conceive that life could be better than what they can produce on their own. Don't clap. Listen. Look at verse 11. Are you still with me? Are you okay with this? Even if you're not, I'm very much okay with it. Look at verse 11. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own what? Spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. So, so uh, this is so beautifully written by Paul. He's going back and forth. He's, he, he's, kind, of, he's kind of hooking us in. 
No eye have seen, no ear has heard, but God has revealed it to us. Then he says, no one can know a person's thought except the spirit of that person. No one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And then look at the next verse. And we have received, come on, help me. And we have received not the world's spirit. So why did we receive God's spirit? So we can what? Know the wonderful things that God has how? Freely give us. Now, if you're sitting here this morning and like, well, I don't know about that. Look at the next verse. Are you ready? When Henny tells you these things, he does not use words that come from his own wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by who? The Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Here's another but. But people who aren't what? Spiritual. I've ever people say, well, you know, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. No, you probably not. <laughs> Hello, somebody. But people who aren't spiritual can't what? Receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds what? Foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can now what? Evaluate things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. Oh, and I love this verse. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? He goes back. Who knows enough to teach him? Who knows the Lord's thoughts? Who knows? He goes back, back and forth, back and forth. But, somebody say, but. We under what? Stand what? These things. Why? For we have the mind of Christ. Do you realize what you got? If you have Christ's mind, that means you have Christ's thoughts. And if you have Christ's thoughts, you can live out Christ's actions. That's why when God says that we must be one with Him, that's why when He says that we must live out this fruitful life as, as Christ lives, why God, has God no problem with that? Because He's given us the Holy Spirit who's given us the mind. We have the mind of Christ. Now, I want you to, I want you to track with me here, okay? Because I've got to go a little bit back to a little bit forward. So hang with me. Are you ready to hang? Okay, look at this. So I'm going to break it up in three things. Watch this. God's thoughts... God's words, God's reality. Let me say it again. God's thoughts. Why? We have the mind of Christ. God's word, the Spirit gives us utterance. God's reality, the wonderful things that God has freely given us. That's what we see in these verses. You see, when before God creates, He thinks. Before you create, come on, you think. How many of you know you don't just walk down the street and find yourself committing adultery? Oh, I, I, I don't know what happened. I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't explain it. I mean, I was just walking down like Elsinore. I was just walking down the street. I mean, that's what I was walk, just walking. Zippity doo da, zippity. And then suddenly I found myself with a prostitute. I don't know how that happened. It's a setup, it's a bait. No, you're a dummy. <laughs> if you think we're all are stupid, no, here's what happens. You have that thought in your mind, and you feed it. You feed that little line. Play with it. Cuddle it. You keep on feeding it. See, but that's the negative. I want to move away from there. The same way is the positive. God's thoughts. We have the, I, I can think like Jesus. I have the mind of Christ. This is the context here. The context is why, so that I know, so that so I'm not confused about what God has for me. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me today. Don't let the enemy lie to you and for him to tell you that what he's got is way better. Oh, he's got maybe some pleasure for you for a season, but the end result is death and dying. 
The end result is wreathing and writhing in pain about what you have done. And you are trapped and lured into it. But you, you don't have to stay there. Remember, God can restore and God can redeem. So even today, if you're in a major mess and you don't know how to get out of it, then I'm telling you, start listening to the mind of the Spirit and not your own. Start leaning on what God has for you. God has you here for a reason. To speak common sense, but not just common sense. To speak biblical wisdom into your heart and mind. Will you listen? God's thoughts. We have the mind of Christ. Think about this. When He created the earth, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord was what? Hovering. And so God was hovering. God was thinking. And then God said God spoke God's thoughts produced God's words and then what did it create God's world God's reality our inward heart attitude should be like the best way I can explain it be like a pool of water you see the problem is uh, when 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 you if you look at a pool of water and it's still you can see your reflection but when 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 you when you disturb the water how many of you know you can't see anything the problem for some of us in this room, some of us online, some of us outside this morning, is that we are trying to find the image of Christ in a disturbed pool of water. We are disturbed by what? Outside circumstances. So yes, what we cannot see. We cannot see the true reflection of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Just like a pool of water that is disturbed, no reflection is seen, only something that's distorted. What does it mean? We have to take our eyes out of the temporary so we can see the eternal. Now, I, I need you to, to hang with me when I say the word eternal. Not just eternity, but the eternal. Do you understand that the eternal is now? Why? Because what you say, and what are you saying? I'm saying you're going to have to look and see that which is going to last. Not that just that which is going to be good for a season, which we know. The Bible says three things will last forever. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. Faith to do the will of God cannot come through a disturbed heart and mind. Only when we are still can we see what needs to be seen. Some of us are too busy to recognize God's will and mind. So here's what we do. We muddle around sin, thinking that it'll give us life, but it leads to death. So you say, Henny, okay, how, how do I move from there to there? Great question, you brilliant group of people. Yes, simply what you have to do, you have to redirect your attention. Is that, is that simple enough? See, you focus on one thing, you focus on another. What do you focus on? Look at Hebrews 12, the very next verse, after he told us what we just read. Are you ready? Look at the next phrase. Hebrews 12 says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished the race. So if I keep my eyes on Jesus, the Holy Spirit produces the reality of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Look at Colossians 3 now. Now, when you in Colossians 3, now I want to start from verse 1. Watch this. Uh, I'm almost done, so just give me a few more minutes. Can you give me a few more minutes? Okay, three of you, that's great. And one of those are my wife. That's pretty spectacular. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 1. Watch this. Since you have been raised to what? New life with whom? Christ. Set your what? Sights on the realities of heaven. Now, I, 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 he did not say set your minds on heaven. He's not talking about the afterlife. And we are get so confused. He's not talking about the afterlife. He's talking about the realities of heaven. And Jesus said, our job as ambassadors of Christ is to bring heaven down here. We must bring the reality from heaven to earth. We pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth as it is. Where? In heaven. Heaven realities can be lived out by somebody who's empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out the realities of heaven so that others can see what it is like to serve God. The problem is the church is living so beneath our reality of what Christ has done for us that the only thing we want is to get raptured out of here. I ain't done yet. Look at this. The realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Why is he telling you that? Because Jesus said, behold, I have all authority and all power. Therefore you go. 
Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Now, is he saying that, okay, how can I think about the things of heaven when I've never been there? So he's not talking about heaven as a place. He's talking about heaven as a reality. What is he talking about? He's talking about the kingdom life. Jesus said, remember, he says, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out devils, the kingdom of God has come to you. He says, whenever you see me do, when you see me, when, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing what? Good. What do we see? God heals, God restores, God brings the dead back to life. He provides. I mean, he, 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 he's at a cookout and there's not enough food. And guess what? He makes enough food. He's bringing heaven realities where there's no lack, where there's, no, where there's the reality of heaven. And he says that's what we are focused on, on the reality of bringing heaven to those on earth. You see, we have this mindset, and, and we could disagree today, that we say this, well, Henny, you know, the whole earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to burn up anyway. Well, I'm changing my mind on that because that word to burn up doesn't necessarily mean destruction. It means purification. So, it, so, so here's what we have. We have a mindset in the church that, okay, all this is going to go to the Antichrist. All this is going to go to all this other stuff. But I can tell you right now that he says the earth is the Lord and the fullness of it. The prophet Isaiah prophesied, and he says that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God did not create something to just simply destroy it. Just blow it up. You know why we say blow it up? Because we didn't make it. Hello, somebody. Say, man, I don't know about this. Well, okay, let's go on. Think about the things of hand, not, not of earth. Why? Why must I do that? Look at verse 3. Are you still with me? Are you tracking? Can you give me a few more minutes? For you died to this what? Life. And your real life. Somebody say, my real life. Is what? Hidden with whom? Christ. Where? And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So I get to share right now in his life, and in the future I get to share in his glory. So because of this reality, because I understand it, then he says, so put to death. The word put to death is the word mortify, which means to put to death by starvation, which means don't feed it. Put it to death. Now, go with me to Galatians 5.16, because this is, this is awesome. Uh, uh, watch this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit do what? Guide your... Then you what? For those of you who didn't hear that, they were reading very well. <laughs> At a fifth grade level, that's profound. <laughs> then you won't be doing... Thank you. See, when the Holy Spirit guides, He don't lead you into depravity. You cannot tell me that you're led by the Holy Spirit and you're yelling in anger at your wife and kids all the time. Because you're not. You can't be telling me that you cheat on your taxes and God understands because this government is evil. You stupid. Come on now, somebody. Well, they are unjust. Doesn't matter. You've got to stay just. There's no way I can solve a fleshly problem with more fleshly actions. You see, we live beyond the power and privilege that is available to us. We are either so bound by sin, our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, or so consumed by our daily lives that we cannot see what is available to us in Christ Jesus. Some of us are so focused on getting raptured out of here and letting the Antichrist take over that we forget that we have a purpose and a function on the earth. Imagine if an ambassador, if somebody, if the U.S. appoints an ambassador to another nation and say, you are going there to our embassy and you're going to represent the United States of America so that they know what we are like. That's what you're there. You're, you're our ambassador. You represent the United States of America. As a matter of fact, the embassy is sovereign ground. It's, it's like being in where? Yeah. It's the United States. You can't just move in there and go in there. You have to have the right documents to get in there. So the embassy, 
represents through the ambassador the nation from which they come, whatever nation that is, all right? Now, what do you think would the person who appoints, in our case, the president, uh, uh, to the ambassador, what do you think he would do if every day he gets a call from the ambassador and saying, get me out of here, 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 get me out of here. Why are you not coming to get me? Oh, if, if you would just come, if you would just come and get me, get me out of the stinking mess. I don't want to be here anymore. And we laugh about that, but that's exactly most Christians' prayers. Come on, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. And he's saying, get you out of there. I place you there so you can represent me so that you're not the only one that's going to be with me for eternity. I place you there so you can represent me. Stop praying, get me out of here, and start letting me fill you with my spirit and power and demonstrate to others what it is to live for me. Represent me well. You are not saved simply to go to heaven. You say, Henny, how do you know that? I know that because right now God is building a city. He's building it. And the Bible says that city is going to come where? Down from where? Heaven. To where? Earth. And he's going to renew everything. No, we're going to be raptured. In and out. Mm, Maybe. Heaven has invaded earth through Jesus. And God... Through what Jesus has done for us on the cross, is reconciling the world to Himself through you. We see this, and I don't have time. I'm out of time. I wish I had five more minutes. I wonder. I feel like the Netflix show. Are you still watching? Or have you quit on me? How about you out there? Look at verse Peter 2, 24, just real quick. We know these verses. Watch this. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So what do we have? Restored fellowship, restored union and fellowship. Reconciled with God and our fellow man. God amongst us through Christ Jesus giving us the power to live in the present and the hope for the future. My present is secure, my future is secure, and my past is forgiven. That's why I don't want to get hung up beneath the surface of the junk that's holding me. I don't want to live in the flesh. I don't want to live in the, I don't want to give the flesh any power. It's not just because, oh, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad to the bone. It's not just that. Yes, I'm bad to the bone, but guess what? God saves me all the way and renews me. What am I looking forward to? I'm looking forward to a body like his. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to a resurrection, not just going to heaven. You see, what do I have? I have forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration. But here's the restoration that I have. Complete unity and union and fellowship. Listen to Colossians 1.27, last verse. To them God has chosen to make known among who? Come on, yell it. Among who? Gentiles. The what? glorious riches of this mystery. Wait, what is the mystery? Christ in you. The hope of what? Glory. Lost in Adam, regained in Jesus. Illustrated, how close does God want us to be with him? How close is this, is this beautiful relationship? He gives us so many illustrations, but I'll give you two. He says, the vine and the branches. How close can you get but vine and branches? If you cut off the branch from the vine, what happens to the branch? It dies. So he says that we, 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 that's how, that's the power of where we live. The vine and the branches. And let me give you another one. He's the head and we are the, the body. He's the, not the tail. <laughs> You're quoting a whole nother scripture now. Some of you are thinking about the wrong thing. Think about the part that stinks, not the part that thinks. Come on now. Can you handle this deep spirituality? 
What happens when you remove the head from the body? Now, how much closer can you get then? You see, here's what sin does. It lies to us. It limits our spiritual vitality. It hinders our necessary spiritual nutrients to get to the branches so that we can bear the fruit to glorify the Father. When I clean my yard, and I'll close with this incredible illustration. I'm just saying it's incredible. I don't know if it is or not. But when I clean my yard, I take my hose, and I hose down the cement. I pick up the dog poop. I, I do the things that I have four grown men in the house that they should be doing. So want you to know they're not. They tell me they're independent, yet they live in my house. Pray for me. But sometimes when I, when I as I clean the yard, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm spraying, and suddenly there's no water. It just stops. And then I'm like, what, what's going on? Then I, as I walk back, what do I find in the hose? A kink. Some of you are just plain kinky, but this is, sometimes I find a kink in the hose and there's no water that's getting to where it needs to come out because there's a kink somewhere. And some of you are living a drip, 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 drip Christian experience when you can have a glorious experience because you allow sin to put a kink in the hose because your mind is so full of this worldly thinking that you cannot think straight. You cannot think straight, and you limit your ability to live that pure life so that the water of the Word can purely flow through you so you can live in the reality of what Christ and who Christ is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. you got to get the kinks out. you got to go beneath the surface, and you got to stop pretending that everything is okay. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay, but you got to be honest about it, and you have to say, I've sinned. I've messed up. I did it. I didn't do it because somebody made me, somebody coerced me. I did it. And what I need is his grace and forgiveness. And what I need is his power so I can think the way he thinks, so I can speak his word to establish his world in mine. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. That, my friend, is the gospel. That's the good news. That's the good news. So you might be here today watching online you're thinking that we're just a bunch of crazy. You know, we, we have some ideology. Jesus is not an ideology. He's, he, he, he changes everything. People say, oh, you know, this whole Christianity is just a crutch for the weak. Yeah, maybe. But I didn't just need a crutch. I needed a whole hospital. Anybody with me? I needed to be restored. As a matter of fact, I needed a heart transplant. I needed to be saved from myself because I have a propensity to go in the wrong direction. If left to my own devices, to my own thoughts, to my own thinking... It only produces a mess. But when I allow the Holy Spirit to renew me and allow God to do something in me, you are the one that limits your potential. Why not today decide? Say, you know what, I've had enough. And you might have to suffer some consequence. But here's the goodness of God, the grace of God, is that sometimes God does rescue us, not always from the consequences, but sometimes He does. And whether He rescues you from the consequence or whether you are today in the consequence whether it's a broken relationship, a broken marriage, whatever it is, decide today that you're going to live your life on a different plane, not by your power, not by your strength, but by the Holy Spirit. And ask the Lord to help you. And you'll be amazed what God will do, but you've got to mean business. You've got to be serious about it. Stop playing on two fields. It's not possible. It's not possible. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today and you say, Henny, I'm really mad at you. Then I say I've done my job. If you need to embrace, maybe you, maybe you are a Christ follower, but you've messed up so much and you just need to know that God loves you. That, 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 that This is nothing to do about the love of God. The worst of sinners God loves. God's love is unconditional. You can't say, well, you know, you don't know the depth of my sin. I don't. And I don't really need to know it because I know all have sinned, every single one of us. You've got, a, you've got a restored sinner preaching up here. We're not focused on sin. We focus on what God has done for us. But we got to admit. So today, if you say, Henny, I'm ready to step into 
the new life that He has for me. I'm, I'm ready to, to, to let Him do for me that I cannot do for myself. I need God. I need God. And I'm not just desperate because I'm in a desperate situation. I recognize that I'm messed up on the inside. And only Christ can truly. I don't just want to make a confession. I don't just want to pray a prayer. I don't just want to act religious. I need God completely to renovate my life. I need Him to wreck me. I need Him to whoop me over. I need Him to give me a new heart and a new life. If you're ready for that. I'm not talking to a sissy. I'm talking to real men, real women. I'm talking to women and men that are ready to take that step. A discipleship that will cost you your life because you are no longer representing you. You're representing Him. If that's you and you would like me to pray with you online, in the building, outside, just pop your hand up and let me see it high. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. You can put it down. I see that back there. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that over there. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. Online, you do the same. Outside, you do the same. God bless you. God bless you. And let me lead you in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of bringing our hearts before Him. Shall we pray? I'm going to ask you online, outside, in the building. Just pray this out loud, out loud with me. Very simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I cannot save myself. I need you. This moment, this very second, I ask you to come and invade my life. I confess that I've sinned. I've messed up. It is all on me of the sin lurking in me. But I know you can and will deliver me from this body of death. And in this moment, I relinquish control. I no longer want to be in charge. I want you to take the reins. Lead me into the freedom that you promised, that you are the vine and I be the branch, that you are the head and I'm part of your body. Release me now. And Father, I pray, whatever the consequence, that you give me the wisdom the power and the ability to face what is necessary but to live in the freedom that you purchased for me. I am free through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that He is worthy of today. Oh, come on somebody. You can do a better job than that.